Hand tools are used every day in construction, manufacturing, and industrial settings, as well as for do-it-yourself projects at home. Hand tools can make it easier and safer to perform any number of jobs. But before you use any type of hand tool, it's important to understand its intended purpose and how to use it safely and efficiently. It's also important to know how to care for your tools so that you can keep them in good condition for a long time. To avoid injuries when you work with hand tools, remember to always wear the appropriate safety gear. Then, draw the hammer back and give the nail a few light taps to start the nail and to determine your aim. Next, take your fingers away from the nail and drive the nail firmly with the center of the hammer face. Keep your hand level with the head of the nail and strike the nail squarely with the hammer face. If the nail is struck at an angle, it may bend and break. The claw side of the hammer should be used to pull nails out of wood. To do this, slip the claw under the nail head and pull until the handle is almost vertical and the nail is partly withdrawn. At this point, you should be able to pull the nail out by hand. If you can't, it may be necessary to place a small wedge, such as a block of wood, under the hammer's head and pull the handle until the nail is free. Before you use a sledgehammer, it's important to check the handle to be sure it's not cracked or broken, and make sure the head is properly secured to the handle. Always wear eye protection when using a sledgehammer, and check your company's procedures to see if you need gloves or any other protective gear. Hold the sledgehammer with both hands. Never use your hands to hold the object to be driven. Position yourself so that the object to be driven is directly in front of you. Then look around and make sure you have plenty of room to swing. Lift the sledgehammer directly over your head and deliver the blow squarely on top of the object to be driven. Never strike the object with the cheek or side of the sledgehammer's head. Doing so could damage the sledgehammer. Whenever you use a wedge, you should wear safety glasses. You should also check your company's procedures to see if a face shield is required as well. Before using a wedge, Check it to make sure it's in good condition. A wedge often becomes mushroomed or flattened out from wear. If this happens, the wedge should be replaced. To lift with a wedge, position the tapered edge of the wedge at the edge of the load to be lifted. Make sure the load is well supported. Strike the heel or wide edge of the wedge firmly with a hammer until the load is lifted. When using a wedge to separate, Place the wedge between two objects and strike it with a hammer. As the wedge moves between the two objects, it should force them to break apart. For this type of job, be sure to wear safety glasses to protect your eyes from any flying metal. Hold the punch with one hand as if you were holding a nail. Then tap the punch firmly and squarely with a hammer. That's really all there is to it. This worker is using a ripping bar to pry apart two pieces of wood. It's important to always use two hands to keep even pressure on your back as you pull. It's also a good practice to wear safety gear when using a ripping bar. It's not uncommon for a piece of material to break off and become airborne. This worker is protecting himself with a hard hat, safety glasses, and gloves. To use a nail puller to remove a nail, drive the claw into the wood astride the nail head. Then pull the handle of the bar to lift the nail out of the wood. If the nail doesn't come out, it may be necessary to place a wedge, such as a block of wood, under the nail puller and repeat the procedure until the nail is removed. In this topic, we looked at several types of hand tools that are used for striking and dismantling. We saw how claw hammers, ball peen hammers, and sledgehammers are used. And we discussed the use of wedges and punches. We also learned about ripping bars and nail pullers. Now is a good time to try some practice questions. Selecting the right screwdriver for the job is the first step in properly using a screwdriver. 
it's important to select the screwdriver with the right type of blade for the screws you'll be using. Using the wrong screwdriver could damage the screwdriver, the head of the screw, the job, or you. Once you've selected the correct screwdriver, be sure it's in good condition before you use it. The handle should not be worn or damaged. The blade's tip should be straight and smooth. If it isn't, it needs to be repaired or replaced. You also want to make sure the screwdriver is clean. A dirty or greasy screwdriver can slip out of the screw head or your hands. To use a screwdriver correctly, insert the tip of the blade into the slot of the screw. Holding the screwdriver perpendicular to the work, apply firm, steady pressure to the screw head and turn. Turn clockwise to tighten, counterclockwise to loosen. An easy memory tool is right is tight and left is loose. Although we used a straight blade screwdriver in our example, the steps are the same for a Phillips screwdriver. Well, we've just looked at one example of a single line diagram. You can see that this type of diagram contains a lot of important information, so you want to be sure you know how to read and understand them. Once you become more familiar with single line diagrams, you'll see how useful they can be. To use a non-adjustable wrench, begin by placing the wrench around the fastener, then pull the wrench toward you. Turn the fastener clockwise to tighten it or counterclockwise to remove it. To use an adjustable wrench, place the fixed jaw against one flat of the fastener. Turn the adjusting screw until the wrench fits snugly against the opposite flat. When turning the fastener, you should always apply force against the stationary jaw and always pull the wrench toward you. Although an adjustable wrench is a handy tool to have, it's not as strong or as durable as a non-adjustable wrench. Also, it's possible for an adjustable wrench to damage the head of the fastener because there is always some play in the movable jaw. For these reasons, you should use an adjustable wrench only when a non-adjustable one is not available. Some jobs involve installing or removing a large number of fasteners. Using a conventional wrench on a job like this can take time because the wrench must be lifted off of the fastener with each turn. A socket wrench can make this type of job faster and easier. When the lever is in one position, the ratchet device locks the socket for tightening, but releases the socket when the handle is swung back to get a new grip. When the lever is set in the opposite position, the ratchet works the opposite way. It locks the socket for loosening and releases the socket when the handle is swung back. To use a socket wrench with a ratchet handle, the first step is to select the right size socket. The socket should fit snugly on the head of the fastener. A socket that is too big may slip and damage the fastener. Next, attach the socket to the ratchet by placing the square end of the socket over the spring-loaded button on the ratchet shaft. A spring-loaded ball or pin holds the socket in place. Once the socket is attached, place the wrench over the fastener and pull the handle. No matter what type of wrench you're using, remember that it's important to keep it in good condition. This means making sure that both the socket and the handle are free of grease and dirt. In this topic, we looked at some hand tools that are used to turn fasteners. We saw two types of screwdrivers designed to install and remove screws. And we also looked at several types of wrenches. Although wrenches have different designs, their general function is the same, to turn fasteners. Now try some practice questions to check your understanding of screwdrivers and wrenches. To check an object to determine if it's horizontally level, Begin by making sure the surface you're working on is clean and free of any debris that may alter the measurement. Then place the level on the surface to be checked. Next, look at the bubble. If it's centered between the two lines, the object is level. If it's not centered, the object will need to be adjusted. Now, keep in mind that a level is a precision instrument, 
so it should be handled with care. Try not to drop your level or bump it against another object. And keep your level clean and dry to keep it in good working condition. This worker is using a plumb bob with a precision surveying instrument. The plumb bob hangs freely from the center of the instrument and it's aligned over a reference point. The plumb bob ensures that the instrument is set up correctly. When you're working outside, be aware that the wind may affect the accuracy of your plumb bob. A plumb bob can also be used to mark a vertical line. To do this, you'll need a combination plumb bob and chalk line. To use this type of chalk line, first pull the string from the case. Hang the bob by the hook or hold the string tightly and allow the bob to swing freely. If you hold the string, you'll need a second person to help you mark the line. Once the weight has stopped swinging, press the line tight against the surface to be marked. Snap the line by pulling it away from the surface and then releasing it. A chalk line is not only used to mark plumb lines. A chalk line can be used on just about any flat surface when a straight line must be marked between two points. When storing a chalk line, remember that it contains dry powder, so it's important to keep it in a dry place. To do this, place the square against the angle to be checked, like this. If the square fits snugly against the material, the material is square. Another common use for a framing square is to check the flatness of a surface. A framing square can also be used for marking a 90 degree angle. To do this, place the square so that it lines up with the bottom of the object to be marked. Mark a line along the edge of the opposite side. The last type of measuring tool we'll discuss is the wooden folding rule. One of the reasons the wooden folding rule is popular is because it's rigid. It's actually several short rigid rules connected by metal or plastic joints. Its rigidity makes it a good choice when measuring short vertical distances. For example, this worker has to measure the length of this compressed airline in order to accurately install a manifold. Another reason the folding rule is popular is because it's fairly light and compact. This makes it handy to carry in your pocket. This folding rule is marked in sixteenths of an inch on both edges of each side. Once the rule or tape is in place, read the measurement by looking straight down at the point to be measured. A reading that is taken by looking at the rule or tape at an angle will not be accurate. If the point to be measured does not line up exactly with any line on the rule or tape, it's usually okay to round off the measurement by taking the reading at the line that's nearest to the point. To maintain a steel measuring tape in good working condition, be careful not to kink or twist the tape. This could cause it to break. Before storing a measuring tape, wipe off any moisture to keep it from rusting and periodically wipe it with a cloth moistened with oil. You should also periodically apply oil to the spring joints of wooden folding rules. In this topic, we saw hand tools that are used for measuring distances and checking alignment. Levels and plumb bobs are two types of tools that can help you determine if an object is truly horizontal or truly vertical. Squares are typically used for measurement and layout. And rules and measuring tapes are used for measuring and marking distances. Next are some practice questions to allow you to check your understanding of these tools. A handsaw is one of the most common hand tools. The basic function of a saw is to cut. Although there are hand saws for cutting many different types of materials, in this part we'll look at saws used for cutting wood. Sometimes it's necessary to use a small thin piece of wood to wedge the kerf open and separate the cut pieces. Place the wedge in the kerf just far enough to alleviate the binding without disturbing the uniformity of the kerf. When you finish cutting, place the saw down gently, being careful not to let the teeth come in contact with stone, concrete, or metal. 
Before you begin cutting, inspect the saw for wear. Make sure that the blade is securely fastened to the handle. Also, make sure that there are no teeth missing and that the teeth are all uniform in shape, length, and direction. Now let's see how to properly use a handsaw. Begin by marking the cut to be made. Make sure the wood is well supported so that it won't shift while you're cutting it. This piece of wood is held in place with two C-clamps. Place the teeth nearest the butt end of the saw a fraction of an inch to the waist side of your mark. This ensures that the cut will not cross your mark. With the saw at the appropriate angle, pull the blade toward you to make a groove or kerf. Start sawing using short, even strokes. Increase the length of the stroke slowly as the kerf deepens. As the wood is being cut, the blade may start to bind. This is caused by tension in the wood trying to force the kerf to close, and it can make sawing difficult if not impossible. Files are used primarily for cutting, smoothing, and shaping metal or wood. They can also be used for sharpening other tools. Files are typically made from hardened steel, and they range in length from about 4 to about 14 inches. Before you begin filing, be sure your work is securely mounted in a vise or secured with clamps. If the material is allowed to vibrate while you work, the file's teeth may become dull. Also, it's a good practice to keep your work at about elbow height. If the file you're using has a handle attachment, you should secure it to the file before you begin. The handle will help you avoid injuring your hand. Still, it's a good idea to wear gloves. Gloves can help prevent calluses if you're going to be doing a lot of filing. Stand away from the vise with your feet about 24 inches apart. If you're right-handed, place your left foot ahead of your right. Hold the file in your right hand and the tip of the blade in your left. If you're left-handed, put your right foot forward and hold the file in your left hand with the tip in your right. Hold the tip with your thumb on the top of the file and your first two fingers under it. For heavy work, you may need to hold the tip with a full hand grip. Apply pressure only on the forward stroke, keeping the file flat on your work. Raise the file from the work on the return stroke to prevent file damage. When you finish the job, it's a good idea to clean your file before you put it away. You can use a wire brush for this. Brush the file in the same direction as the teeth. Remember that the bristles of the wire brush are steel and susceptible to rust, so always keep the wire brush dry. When you're ready to store a file, put it in a dry place. Try to keep files separated to avoid chipping or damaging them. The wood chisel is used for making cuts in wood by chipping away small pieces. For example, this worker is building a wooden frame. To do this, he'll need to make a recess in one piece of wood and fit the second piece into it. First, he'll measure and mark the wood. Then he'll set the chisel at one end of the mark, with the bevel facing the recess to be made. Next, he'll strike the chisel with a mallet. This is important. Striking a wooden or plastic handled chisel with a hammer could damage the chisel. Next, the worker will make another cut opposite the first. Now he'll make a series of cuts about a quarter of an inch apart from one end of the recess to the other. To trim the recessed area, he'll hold the chisel bevel up to slice from the edge of the recess inward. The cold chisel is used to cut or shape cold metal. However, it should only be used on metals that are softer than the chisel itself. To use a cold chisel, position the cutting edge and strike the opposite end with a ball-peen hammer. One of the handiest tools a worker in almost any trade can have is a utility knife. A utility knife can be used for cutting a variety of materials, including cardboard, roofing felt, asbestos shingles, vinyl, sheetrock, and insulation. To accommodate different types of materials, 
Some utility knives have a feature that allows you to lock the blade in several different positions. This allows you to cut materials of different thicknesses. For example, some materials, like this vinyl floor tile, are thin. But this piece of sheetrock is relatively thick. In addition, different blades are available for special jobs. For instance, this hook-type blade is designed to cut materials such as carpet. The advantage to this blade is that it can be used against concrete floors without dulling the blade or damaging the surface below. Before you use a utility knife, it's a good practice to place a piece of scrap material, such as a piece of wood, under the object to be cut. This will protect the surface beneath the object. When you're ready to begin cutting, extend the knife blade to the appropriate position and lock it in place. Use the long, razor-sharp side of the blade to cut straight lines. Never pull the blade towards any part of your body. Angle your work so that you're not pointing the knife directly at yourself. When you're done, retract the blade and lock it in. To avoid damaging the material you're cutting, never use a dull blade. Although the blades can be sharpened, they are so inexpensive that it is usually preferable to replace them. When replacing the blade, it's a good idea to wear gloves to protect yourself from the sharp blade. Also, be sure to properly dispose of the old blade. In this topic, we discuss some of the most common cutting hand tools. We looked at cross-cut saws and rip saws used for cutting wood. We also saw several types of files designed for cutting and shaping wood or metal. Then we looked at two types of chisels used for cutting and shaping wood or metal. And we examined a utility knife used for cutting a variety of materials. Now try to answer some practice questions to allow you to check your knowledge of these cutting tools. To use slip joint pliers, first determine which position is necessary for the job. In the normal position, the jaws touch each other when they're closed. In this position, the pliers can be used to grip small objects. For gripping larger objects, the jaws can be set farther apart. To do this, spread the handles and then slide one handle back until the joint pin slips from one hole to the other. Once the setting is right, place the jaws around the object and squeeze the handles until contact is made. To use these pliers, hold them with one finger positioned inside the handle. This allows you to open the pliers easily. Then grasp and hold the object with a firm, full fist grip. When you use lineman pliers to cut wire, be sure you always point the loose end of the wire down and cut at a right angle to the wire. To keep your pliers in good working condition, oil them regularly to prevent rust. And you can avoid damaging your pliers by never exposing them to excessive heat and never using them as a wrench or a hammer. Before you use a bench vise, be sure it's securely fastened to the bench. Open the jaws as wide as necessary by turning the handle counterclockwise. When the jaws are open wide enough to insert the work between them, Position the work and tighten the jaws against it by turning the handle clockwise. If you're using a bench vise to hold work to be sawed, try to position the work so that you're sawing as close to the jaws as possible. Before you use a C-clamp, check to be sure the frame is not bent and that the swivel pad turns freely. If you'll be clamping your work onto a work surface, be sure the clamp and your work will be well supported. Turn the handle counterclockwise until the screw is open enough to accommodate the work. If the material you'll be clamping is soft, protect it by placing pads or thin blocks of wood between the clamp and the work. Tighten the handle by turning it clockwise, being careful not to over-tighten it. Over-tightening can cause marks or may even damage the work. Once you've finished the job, clean the C-clamp and store it carefully to prevent damage to the frame. And as with the bench vise, it's a good idea to clean and oil the threads of a C-clamp periodically. In this topic, 
we went over a few hand tools that can be used for gripping and holding. For instance, we saw that pliers are used for gripping and holding small objects. Bench vices are used for holding large objects. And C-clamps are used for holding small, lightweight objects. Now try some practice questions to see if you understand this material. Selecting the right screwdriver for the job is the first step in properly using a screwdriver. It's important to select the screwdriver with the right type of blade for the screws you'll be using. Using the wrong screwdriver could damage the screwdriver, the head of the screw, the job, or you. Once you've selected the correct screwdriver, be sure it's in good condition before you use it. The handle should not be worn or damaged. The blade's tip should be straight and smooth. If it isn't, it needs to be repaired or replaced. You also want to make sure the screwdriver is clean. A dirty or greasy screwdriver can slip out of the screw head or your hands. To use a screwdriver correctly, insert the tip of the blade into the slot of the screw. Holding the screwdriver perpendicular to the work, apply firm, steady pressure to the screw head and turn. Turn clockwise to tighten, counterclockwise to loosen. An easy memory tool is right is tight and left is loose. Although we used a straight blade screwdriver in our example, the steps are the same for a Phillips screwdriver. In this topic, we looked at some hand tools that are used to turn fasteners. We saw two types of screwdrivers designed to install and remove screws. And we also looked at several types of wrenches. Although wrenches have different designs, their general function is the same, to turn fasteners. Now try some practice questions to check your understanding of screwdrivers and wrenches.